Okay, everybody, listen up. I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon and the Blackest Heart, both books published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. Today I'm going to be reviewing Hunter's Oath by Michelle West. book came out in 1995. It's actually book one in a magnificent 16 book series, which I've got over here, all of them. I've read all of them. We're going to be rereading them in order of publication uh, for the channel and leaving a review eventually for all of them. I don't know, it might take me 10 years to do it, but we're going to do it. Starting with book one that came out in 95. Now let's talk about <clears throat> the cover first, then we'll talk about the series as a whole, and then, then we'll get into the nitty gritty details of this book specifically. So the cover is this great, great, gorgeous painting by Jody Lee. Now, Jody Lee did the covers of every single one of these books, except for one of them. And that one was done by Steve Ewell. But every one of her covers is dynamite on these things. We've got our two hunters with their hunting dogs and the demon following them. And all of this stuff plays a huge role in the story. And it's just a gorgeous cover by Jody Lee. Now let's talk about the series as a whole. Now it starts with these this small duology, the Hunter's duology, Hunter's Oath and Hunter's Death. Another great Jody Lee painting. But um, though the, this is where you start, uh, and it's a duology takes place about 16 years before the main series. So it's a bit of a prequel. So those go together. So we'll put those there. And then we jump into this trilogy here that is about a band of thieves in the city. And this is on um, the Hidden City. Let's see, they're all backwards here. The Hidden City, City of Night, and House Name. This trilogy also takes place 16 years before the main story so we can put these five books over here i would suggest reading them in order but if you don't want to read those five you can start with book the broken crown also another great jody lee painting this is the start of the main story which is one two three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven books long. And if you just wanted to start there, you won't miss anything other than the five book prequel books. That's all you're missing. Every single book should be read, though. That's what I'm saying. Start from the start. <clears throat> Don't start from the middle. Because that's the way I'm going to be reviewing them on the channel. And let's start with book number one. These are... Very, very well put together, strong world building, strong prose. I love her prose. I love Michelle West prose. I love her character development. She does everything great. And Daw Books has put together a magnificent 16 book series here. Hunter's Oath starts out with Stephen, who's a thief, a young thief, um, and Lord Soradin Elspeth. And the opening scene between those two is kind of like this thievery gone wrong. Stephen tries to thieve from Soradin. Soradin and his dogs, and Soradin's dogs, who are on the cover, are um, named uh, Corwell and Merritt. Well, they give chase to the young thief. They catch the young thief. And they take the young... Rather than punish the young thief, they sort of take him under wing. Because they've got a purpose for him. And we'll get to the purpose here in a minute. But as all of this is happening, we've got a third character named Yvain Anolan, who is watching this entire thing through a crystal ball. About the size of my Beatles logo. She's watching it through a crystal ball. She's watching everything. In fact, most everything that happens in this book, this Yvain Anolan, sort of this witch, this pagan witch, watches over everything through the crystal ball. You know what a crystal ball is. <clears throat> so anyway, um, Stephen is taken, the young thief Stephen is taken in by Lord Elspeth. 
into the castle and he's actually given really nice chambers and he's like well these people aren't throwing me in the dungeon this is weird in fact they've given me what looks to be the nicest room in the castle and so that's where i'm going to stop for a second and i'm just going to read the back description because it does a much better job than i do of describing the backstory to all this so when the covenant was made with the hunter god all who dwelt in Briodenir swore to abide by it. The hunter lords and their hunting dogs, to which their minds were specially attuned, would seek out game in the god's woods to provide food for their people. And the hunter god would ensure that the hunters, the land, and the people would prosper. So there's sort of this deal between the hunter god that um, if you do certain things, if you abide by a certain amount of my rules, I will let you hunt. In fact, I will watch over your hunts and make sure that everything goes, goes well. But in payment, once a year, the sacred hunt must be called. The God's own hunt in which the prey becomes one of the Lord's or his hunt brother. This was the hunter's oath sworn to by each Lord and his hunt brother the companion chosen from the common folk to remind each lord of his own ties to humanity. So this is where we get into the sticky stuff. So, once a year, the hunter god requires a special hunt called the sacred hunt, in which the hunter becomes the hunted. One of the lords because, becomes the hunted, or he can choose his hunt brother to become the hunter. And like if the lord doesn't want to go out and die, he can choose a hunt brother. Now this is what's happened. Stephen the young thief, from the beginning of the book, was chosen as Lord Elspeth's hunt brother. In other words, we will become hunting brothers when it comes time for the sacred hunt, rather than me go out and risk death. You will be my hunt brother. That's why young Stephen is given such good chambers and is given such good food and treated almost like royalty because they know you're the dude that's gonna you're the common one you're the one you're one of the common folk that our lord has chosen to become his hunt brother so you can go sacrifice yourself in the sacred hunt so it was this oath pledged in blood by gillian of elspeth and the orphan boy stephen and the fulfillment of the oath which would lead them to a kind of destiny of which legends were made. So you know that that's the setup of the story, but is it really going to go down like that? Or will these people become friends? Will will they become companions? Will they be just become... If you like um, your books with uh, queer characters, um, that's one of the... Rela I just I won't spoil it anything, but one of the relationships in this book goes that way. And so if you like that, that's cool. I thought it was an interesting twist that I wasn't expecting. The story bounces between um, Elaine, the sorceress, Stephen, and um, Soradin, the Lord Elspeth. And uh, it gets into their exploits, which are interesting and easy to follow. The writing is crystal clear. You'll never get lost in this book. There is a fair amount of characters, but just not an overwhelming amount. And... Um, it bounces between those. Now, I will say that Elaine's part of the story um, is more or less the less interesting. She's the sorceress that looks through the globe. She, her parts of the story were the less interesting to me. However, you need to pay attention to them because most of the world building is done through her eyes. In fact, most of the world building as it, in regards to, as it will pertain to the rest of this stuff, is taken care of. In fact, there's more foresh after reading this, there's more foreshadowing in this tiny prequel to the rest of the 16 books than I was expecting. So to me, it lets me know that Michelle West, even in 1995, when she was writing this book as a prequel, you know, because this book, the very final number 16 came out just a year or two ago. I mean, she's been writing these for over 25 years. She had a big master plan that she was putting together. And uh, you can tell just by some of the hints that are just sort of casually tossed out in this book. Anyway, I did enjoy Stephen and Lord Elspeth's side of 
the tale a little bit more because it involved the hunts and a little bit more action. Elaine uh, Anolan's her her sorcery sort of thing. It was more about the backstory, um, the info dumps, things like that. It was it had a lot more to do with that and a little bit more of the political intrigue. And she was kind of the bad person in the story. Anyway, anyway, I like the book. So, okay, magnificent start to a 16-book series. I gotta say, I hadn't read this since 1995. And I was absolutely just enjoying every moment of rereading it. And I can't wait to get to the rest because I know these books get very deep and very plot-heavy. And just a lot of different characters. And it's just one of the treasures in the fantasy genre these books, all of them, every one of them is just really super good. And this first book was really great. I really enjoyed rereading re it. I am going to give it um, a solid 8 out of 10. Um, and uh, they, they only get better from there. They only get better from there.